Hi there! You didn't expect this little fellow, right? So this is the unicorn and I think that in these days we all need a little bit of joy and happiness. I like this little fellow. I actually wore this little fellow when I was going to a Muse concert. Be that as it may, we are here to do some serious scientific business because grammar is rad. So first, some mechanical things. I don't know if you've noticed, but uh, I actually spent a couple of days revamping our website. So the course website now features some big improvements, hopefully. So let me quickly walk you through these improvements in the website and then we will actually move to the lecture itself. So let's take a look at the website. So as you can see, apparently the website looks identical to the old website. But that's only partially true because now if you scroll, you will see that uh, that mess of multiple Google Drive folders is gone. What you have now is just course news and announcements, including the announcement that the site has been revamped. You have homework for the next week. This is actually this week. You have links to lectures, practice classes, gay one materials and results from exams and midterms. And of course, you can also get to the same points by clicking on the navigation menu, which you have on the right hand side, uh, sorry, left hand side. Uh, if you are accessing this from your cell phones, you will have the very familiar three dots. You remember three dots and you know three dots from most mobile websites. So the menu only looks like this if you're in full screen mode on Windows. So when you go to gate two lectures, you have a link to my YouTube channel so you can always go and look at watch the lectures there uh, you have the pdf files uh, which are actually slide decks that i use during the lectures and i also included the lectures as you know thumbnail videos that you can play from here and then switch to full screen for each lecture you will have the main topics that are addressed the homework and of course, uh, below you have the PDFs themselves. The key to the homework is in the Google Drive in practice classes. But wait for it, wait for it. Yeah, here it is. But you can also get direct access from this page, Gay Lectures. But I will only upload these keys after a week has passed. So you are doing this at home, right? Right? You're doing this at home. And then you are only checking. I am pretty sure that nobody, there's nobody who hasn't done this and you will now just check this. Uh, so if you click here, you get the key and the key is actually the slide deck, which I would have used for face-to-face -face practice classes, but unfortunately we don't have practice classes face-to-face -face now. So that's it for the website. If you don't like it, send me some feedback. We can modify it. If you like it, that's also good feedback. Send some feedback that you like it, but there's always room for improvement. So I'm really looking forward to some comments on whether this is now better organized than previously. Uh, so now we have a lecture to do. So let's start the official lecture. So in this fifth lecture, if you look at the schedule, we really are exactly on schedule. And if you look at the rest of the schedule, Next week, I will upload the second presentation of Adverbios together with homework for that section of the 
course, but you will also be introduced to the format of your midterm exam. Then, in April, you are supposed to have an April examination period, but based on everything that we are receiving as information from the ministry and the government, there will be no April examination period. We don't know what it means for the academic year. Most likely the academic year will move forward, but will be prolonged. So what is the April examination period could become a June examination period. What is June could become July examination period. We'll see. But right now, the latest information is no April examination period. So most likely, unless we get some additional clarifications from the ministry and the faculty and the university, there will probably be no lectures uploaded in these two weeks of April, starting from the 6th of April to the 18th of April. So the first uh, lecture that you can expect is on the 21st, where we will focus on simple sentence then we can actually have a very nice overview of the simple sentence on the 28th and we'll see how this goes, whether the emergency situation will be reduced to, let's say, something which is less urgent at that point. But whether we do it face to face or we do it online, we will finish by May the 26th. So uh, other organizational things that I would like to draw attention to, you should have received invitations to office hours. If you haven't, check your spam folder. If you have received them, then accept them with yes, maybe tentatively. Or just don't say no. Even if you don't plan to attend the office hours, just don't reply no. Why? Because if you click no, the invitation will not end up in your calendar. If you say yes, maybe tentatively, depending on your mail client, what happens is that this event is inserted into your calendar automatically. So you have my office hours in your calendar up until the end of June. And in that event, you just click on it or tap on it if you're on a cell phone and the event opens up and you get the link to join the office hours. So I already mentioned that the course is uh, now um, hosted on a website that is updated where the homework is. So the next thing that I would like to discuss and I will uh, put up a form on the website maybe we can have some homework discussions via Google Meet. Maybe not today, maybe on Thursday, but after that, uh, maybe after, um, let's say, the official slot for the lectures on Tuesday from 1 to 1.30 to 4, we can have Google Meets for those who maybe encountered some unclarities or some issues in the homework or would like to discuss some things they think that something is a bigger so whatever it is we could have some kind of you know practice class where, which is more like a discussion on what you did over the previous week in your homework so i'll put up a vote and you vote and then depending on the vote, it's democracy, we will either have this or we won't have this. So now, finally, the lecture. What did we do last week? Uh, last week, we focused on the functions of the prepositional phrase and with all other phrases, it's the same uh, as with the prepositional phrase. They can be independent or dependent, but there's a twist. But let's focus first on the independent functions. When prepositional phrases are independent, they are sentence elements. When they are dependent, they are not sentence elements. And here comes the twist. Unlike adjective phrases, prepositional phrases, like adverb phrases, can also be particles of phrasal 
prepositional verbs. Uh, so when they are independent, they are adverbials, sometimes obligatory adverbials, object and subject complements, and very rarely subjects like at home is where we all have to be right now. So stay at home. When they are dependent, they are parts of a noun phrase. So lectures from home, from home is post modification of a noun phrase. Um, maybe something like um, faster than a bullet, then a bullet is post modification of an adjective phrase or an adverb phrase, depending on how you use fast. And particles of phrase of verbs, sometimes prepositions are parts of the phrase of prepositional verb, such as look after. And we had a test last week where I showed you how using the pronoun substitution, so whether you can say he gave it up or he looked it up, or you have to say she looked after them or she looked them after. You can decide whether something is a phrasal or if something is a prepositional or an adver uh, adverb particle. So he looked after them. The fact that you have to say he looked after them and you cannot say he looked them after means that this after is a prepositional particle. And then we talked about meanings of prepositions. And of course, these are the meanings of prepositional phrases headed by these prepositions. But it's very important to understand that these meanings are actually coming from the preposition itself. That's why these are not really meanings of prepositional phrases. These are meanings of prepositions. And these meanings are carried over to, for example, prepositions used in phrasal prepositional verbs. And we talked about space as a basic prepositional meaning. So something like, I did it in my house, so let's say the lecture, um, or I did it on top of my house, which I didn't. Uh, but then you can extend that on meaning of space to time, and you can say we did it on Tuesday, and then you can extend it to process, contingency, and other meanings such as accompaniment. And I hope you had a lot of fun doing that exercise at home where you have to classify prepositional meanings. So for today, the real new topics that we will cover deal exclusively with adverbials. So we will first talk about adverbials in general, what they are, what forms and what types there are. Then we'll switch to adverbial positions, so where you can put them in a sentence. Then we'll discuss optionality of adverbials. Strictly speaking, most people say that adverbials are optional sentence elements, but as you well know, also from the first year or actually the first semester course they are not always optional sometimes they are obligatory and we will wrap up with an introduction to the meanings of adverbials and this topic is immensely important because the order of adverbials is not really free uh, it depends on their meanings you know that for example uh, when you were learning english very early that your teachers probably told you that the order of adverbials is MPT, manner, place, time. So you did it wonderfully at your home last Friday. It sounds weird if you say that you do, did it last Friday at your home wonderfully. Uh, if you pronounce it properly, if you put the stress on some of these adverbials, it may sound okay in a given context, but if you're aiming for, let's say, completely neutral, unmarked sentence, an everyday sentence, then the order depends on the meanings. And the preferred order is manner, place, and time, plus some other meanings. As you will see, there are many almost a dozen adverbial meanings. So let's dive in. This completely unrelated to your 
current situation and stay-at-home order and the pandemic is the end of your let's say grammar childhood as it was the end of childhood for one of the characters in the game of thrones you know who i'm talking about so uh why because what follows is a completely new let's say way of dealing with grammar the winter has come literally if you look through your windows you may see that it's snowing at least now that i'm recording this it's snowing so the winter has come and we are actually destroying the boundaries that kept us from doing some things that we should have done earlier so so far we were like kids this is our childhood end. we were in baby shoes now we are moving if you are ladies actually you are moving to stilettos uh in what sense uh, let me explain so initially we talked about individual words in the first semester nouns verbs auxiliaries determiners and then we talked about how you can actually combine these words and we looked at the big perspective of putting these words into different phrases and i'm pretty sure that you love this then these phrases we analyze them in detail so you remember that we analyzed the verb phrase in the first semester now we analyzed the adjective phrase the adverb phrase prepositional phrase so fundamentally we analyzed all phrases and i'm pretty sure that you also love that a lot it was probably and it is true love but now we are making a huge step up so we are no longer looking at individual words nor phrases we are actually looking at how these phrases perform certain functions in a sentence so we are detaching ourselves from the superficial analysis you remember when i told you that we are looking only at the surface level no we are starting to snorkel and go deep under the sea to look how these phrases perform functions in a sentence so we are starting to look at the sentence level we are no longer looking at phrases we are looking at sentences and their elements so this is going to be beyond true love so this is real grammar and syntax so we start with adverbials and then we will analyze clauses and we will wrap up with sentences so this is the beginning of your adulthood in terms of grammar and the end of your childhood so what are adverbials this is the intro part on adverbials it's completely new as i said we are no longer looking at phrases this is very important to understand this we are looking at elements of a sentence so we are no we are in the early days we were focused on phrases and what functions phrases perform in a sentence now we are flipping the perspective we are looking at a sentence or a clause and we're looking at elements of these sentences as clauses so and we are interested in how they operate and we don't care we do care actually uh, how they are formed what kinds of phrases are used to form some parts of a sentence but we are actually switching a perspective so what are adverbials if you look it up in a dictionary or someplace else not wikipedia sometimes wikipedia is misleading so an adverbial is a sentence element you can read it which gives extra or additional information about time place manner described by the rest of the clause and it's fundamentally different from other four sentence elements subjects verbs objects and complements in several significant ways first of all they have a wider range of forms 
subjects, verbs, object, complements, they are usually just one or two phrases, two types of phrases, and a clause. So subject is either a noun phrase or let's say a nominal clause. Verb phrase is only uh, the only thing that can function as a verb. Objects are typically noun phrases or clauses. For adverbials, you have multiple possibilities, adverb phrases, noun phrases, prepositional phrases, clauses. On top of that, unlike subject, verb, object, and complement, adverbials can appear in many positions. So you know that the word order in English is fixed. So you cannot create normally, unless you're Yoda, a sentence which is SOV in, sir, in English. But with the adverbial, you can easily put it in multiple positions. You can say, yesterday I watched a good TV series. Or I, yesterday, watched a really good TV series. I watched a really good TV series yesterday, or I binge watched it. So you see this yesterday can go to the initial, media or final position, but you cannot say I watched Westworld and then simply switch it to Westworld I watched or watched I Westworld. So this is a big difference when it comes to adverbials. And on top of that, adverbials have a wide range of meanings. Verb is always a verb. It is the activity or state that presides or rules over the whole clause. Object is uh, the patient, the theme, the recipient. But when it comes to adverbials, you have almost a dozen or more, or depending on classification, two dozen different meanings. And probably the biggest difference in relation to all other sentence elements, as we all see, is the possibility that you can have multiple adverbials. You cannot say something like, John, the government, watched the TV series in the sense that what John and the government, uh, you need to use a conjunction to say John and the government watched Westworld, for example. But with adverbials, you simply put them there and you don't need conjunctions like and to join them together in a sentence. So you can say yesterday around 5 p.m. on HBO, I started watching the new episode of Westworld. And by the way, you should watch Westworld. It's really cool. Uh, so this is the idea. You can have, for example, two verbs, two verbs like I, let's say, I reject and oppose this proposal. So reject and oppose are two verbs two verb phrases, but they have to be joined by a conjunction. With adverbials, there's no need for a conjunction. That's like the magic and the power of adverbials. Now, we can talk about their forms. This is still part of the introduction. So, when we talked about phrases, we always talked about which, let's say, forms the phrase can take. So whether it can have pre-modification, post-modification, what do you, what you have in this pre-modification, what you have in post-modification. Here, the perspective is different. So you are looking at all phrases or maybe even clause, clauses that can function as adverbials. So when it comes to adverbials, as I mentioned in the introductory slides, they can have multiple forms. They have the widest range of forms when it comes to sentence elements. So adverbials can be phrases. Almost all phrases can function as adverbials and they can also be clauses. So 
when you have a sentence and you need an adverbial, you can choose between phrases and clauses to build your adverbial. When it comes to phrases, the most typical phrase which functions as an adverbial is an adverb phrase. We discussed this two weeks ago. So, she sleeps soundly, he got brutally killed, you remember those examples. They are the crucial elements in a sentence, adverbials, their meaning is crucial to the sentence. But the typical, prototypical adverbials are adverb phrases. Very close to adverb phrases in terms of frequency are adverbials that are noun phrases. It may surprise you, but that's actually true. When you say, I did it last week, last week is a noun phrase. Or yesterday, according to some grammarians, is also a noun phrase. Uh, so I saw it yesterday. According to some other grammarians, it's an adverb phrase, but it's open for discussion. And of course, what we did a week ago, prepositional phrases very often function as adverbials. Sometimes optional, like he arrived, and then you add to Novi Sad, or obligatory, he lives in Novi Sad. So in Novi Sad is either optional or obligatory, depending on the verb. Then you can also use clauses to build your adverbials, and those clauses can be finite, non-finite, but based on the fact that you have some space on the right hand side of the screen you can guess that there is a third possibility and there is these are verbless clauses so the most famous of them is when in rome do as romans do but we will not actually do as romans do because they are not obeying the government orders and staying at home so when in rome do not do as romans do stay at home so adverb phrases some examples on top of what i just told you is just then the phone rang he plays golf as well as mary etc these are examples from your workbook when it comes to noun phrases on top of what again i told you is something like we see each other every day or even he traveled a long way a long way is not an object here. You cannot passivize it. You cannot say a long way had been traveled by them. Uh, so, or he went that way or that way, that way was gone by him. So these babies are actually adverbials. So sometimes what looks like an object is actually an adverbial. So don't simply assume that if something is a noun phrase, it has to be a subject or an object. No, it can be an adverbial. When it comes to prepositional phrases, everything that we talked about uh, last week can be used as, as an example. So call me in the morning, he plays the piano with enthusiasm, etc. In terms of clauses, nice examples for finite clauses can be found in your workbook. So, for example, call me when you feel like it. When you feel like it is a finite clause function as an adverbial. When it comes to non-finite clauses, another nice example again comes from your workbook. And this is something like, let's say, he played to win. He played is a good sentence. You don't have to say anything else. He played to win. You are specifying the purpose, the goal of your playing. He sang a song wishing to impress her. So here, instead of an uh, infinitival clause, you have the ing participle clause. This is again purpose. So he wanted to impress her. And urged by his friends, this is ed participle clause. He entered the competition. This, this is the reason, or maybe even again purpose. Uh, this is more reason, not purpose. And finally, as I told you, verbal clauses, when in Rome, do as Romans do, but also when in doubt, be generous. I go there as often as possible. 
nervous, he opened the door. Don't mix this with nervously, he opened the door. Nervously is an adverb phrase. Nervous is a verbose clause. So verbose clauses can have adjectives or prepositional phrases and subordinators in uh, the initial position when in doubt, when in Rome. So with this, we actually finished the overview of the syntactic forms of adverbials. This brings us to the last main topic for the introductory part of this lesson, and this is types of adverbials. So we now know how you can build an adverbial using noun phrases, adverb phrases, prepositional phrases, finite, non-finite, and verbose clauses. But how do you classify them? from the point of view of syntax. This was the classification based on form. So this is this what we just discussed is actually a question in your uh, oral exam, which we don't know how will be, you know, uh, realized, but uh, let's not think about it right now. So this is another question. So classification of adverbials, syntactic classification of adverbials. Well, uh, we use the same classification that we use when we discussed adverbials realized as prepositional phrases. So this overlaps to a significant degree with the discussion on prepositional phrases and their functions. So uh, generally speaking, everything that you know for adverbials realizes prepositional phrases applies to adverbials in general. Uh, the classification, syntactic classification, is based on a single criterion, how well these adverbials are integrated into the structure of the clause. So if you have, let's say, a scale of integration of adverbials into the structure of the clause, you can say that adjuncts are those which are best integrated into the structure of the clause. They are like, you know, deeply integrated into the structure of the clause. Disjuncts and conjuncts, on the other hand, are peripheral to the structure of the clause. So they are, let's say, somehow marginal in comparison with adjuncts. Of course, this classification is not based on some sort of armchair linguistic thinking. Uh, the fact that adjuncts are integrated, like they are walking naturally or he lives in a small village, is not only intuitively clear when you compare it to disjuncts, which are peripheral, and convey speakers' comments such as, let's say, naturally I do not approve of her, obviously they love each other, and again, adjuncts are integrated in comparison to conjuncts which have only connective function, uh, such as, let's say, it was a difficult exam, nevertheless he passed it successfully. So, this classification is not simply, let's say, based on somebody's intuition. There are tests which prove that adjuncts are different from disjuncts and conjuncts when it comes to their integration in the structure of the clause. And these seven tests are listed in your workbook, and this is actually a scan of what you have in the workbook, but I created additional slides so that we can focus on each of these tests in details. So the first evidence that adjuncts are really integrated in the clause structure is exemplified by these sentences. However, John is dating Angelina this week. However, John is dating Angelina this week. Let's focus on these two adverbials marked in red. This week as opposed to however. This week can be moved. 
in the focus of the cleft sentence. You can say, however, it is this week that John is dating Angelina. But you cannot do the same thing with however. You cannot say it is however that John is dating Angelina this week. We already discussed these cleft sentences. This is what some people call focusing. So uh, these cleft sentences are the major piece of evidence to support our claim that adjuncts are integrated into the clause structure. They can be the focus. Disjuncts and conjuncts cannot be the focus of the cleft sentence. It sounds very odd. It is, however, that John is dating Angelina this week sounds terrible. This is one piece of evidence, but there are six more. The second evidence can be exemplified using more or less the same sentence. However, John is dating Angelina this week, and however, John is dating Angelina this week. In the first case, you can ask a question so that the answer is the adjunct. When is John dating Angelina? And you say, this week. Can you ask a question so that the answer is however? No. If you can think of a question word so that the answer is however, you could win a Nobel Prize in linguistics. Actually, it doesn't exist, but you would become as famous as Noam Chomsky. There is no question word that can answer, that can be answered by however. So, in other words, the second piece of evidence that adjuncts are different from disjuncts and conjuncts is that adjuncts can be the focus of a question. These are also called constituent questions. Disjuncts and conjuncts cannot be the focus of a question. So this was the second piece of evidence. So let's move to the third one. The third piece of evidence can be again exemplified using the same sentence. However, John is dating Angelina this week, and however, John is dating Angelina this week. Uh, in case of adjuncts, you can make an alternative question based on the adjunct. So you can say, is John dating Angelina this or next week? And then the answer is this week. But can you say something like, is John dating Angelina this week, however, or whatever? And then you say, however. No, it doesn't work. So this is called a binary or an alternative question. So adjuncts can be the focus of a binary or alternative choice question, whereas disjuncts and conjuncts cannot be the focus of a binary choice question or an alternative question. So we are almost halfway through this pieces of evidence supporting that adjuncts are indeed integrated in the clause structure. The fourth evidence diverts from Angelina, and we are focused on John. <laughs> so let's look at, however, John graduated in 1999. And the same sentence, but let's think about extending it. Let's you try using ellipses. With adjuncts, you can say, however, John graduated in 1999 and so did Angelina, which means, however, John graduated in 1999 and Angelina graduated in 1999. If you try to do the same thing, it doesn't mean However, John graduated in 99, and however, Angelina graduated in 1999. So, this however is not in the clause structure of John graduated in 99. It's peripheral, because if you extend this graduation with some sort of ellipses or the operator construction, which allows you to express yourself more efficiently, however is not included in that. Nobody who's 
at least somewhat proficient in English, would say that however John graduated in 1999 and so did Angelina actually means however John graduated in 99 and however Angelina graduated in 1999. You only have one however. And that is another major piece of evidence that adjuncts are really integrated into the clause structure and disjuncts and conjuncts are not. So adjuncts are the fancy expression for what I just explained is that adjuncts are contained in the predication ellipses, whereas disjuncts and conjuncts are never contained in the predication ellipses. Why? Because they are peripheral. That's the whole point of this. And by the way, this is a separate question in the uh, oral exam. So syntactic um, types of adverbials and evidence to support this classification. So we are close to uh, finalizing our case for adjuncts being integrated into the clause structure. The fifth evidence uh, can be again focused on John and we again have however, but this time we have quickly as an adjunct. However, John left quickly. You cannot say quickly, John didn't leave, but you could if you are Jedi Yoda. Uh, say it, only I can, would Yoda say. So about quickly, John didn't leave, as you say it, only I can. Uh, on the other hand, if you say, to my regret, John left quickly, you can say, to my regret, John didn't leave quickly. So what this actually means is that adjuncts cannot appear in the initial position in a negative declarative clause, but disjuncts and conjuncts can appear in the initial position in a negative declarative clause. Why? Because they are not seen as a part of the clause. They are peripheral. So, this is also, by the way, the reason why we put commas after conjuncts and disjuncts in the initial position. Somehow intuitively, we feel that disjuncts and conjuncts are separate from the rest of the clause. And negation, which operates on the level of a clause, is another example because the negation doesn't stretch over the adjunct if you put it in the initial position because the negation starts from the negative word, so from didn't. But disjuncts and conjuncts are completely, completely immune to this. And with this, believe it or not, we finished the intro to adverbials. Now we will move to the next topic and that is adverbial positions. When it comes to adverbial positions, you already know something. I told you in the introduction, adverbials are versatile. They can appear in fundamentally any position in a sentence. And they also follow a specific order. So you probably know this series. So if you watch the series, you could encounter something like she was killed yesterday around three o'clock in the morning with a night in her apartment. This is terrible and grammatically awkward. The way that you should say it is she was killed with a knife in her apartment around three o'clock in the morning yesterday, taken from the real uh, episode. So why is this better? Because the meaning of adverbials determines their order and the preferred order is manner, place, time. So here, and this is the reason why we will spend so much time talking about the meanings of adverbials, is that meaning, semantics, has great influence on syntax. So we will devote a lot of time on the semantic classification of adverbials. Right now, so, what are the adverbial positions? 
we cannot simply say that they can appear everywhere or anywhere in the sentence. So in order to figure out where exactly we can put that, put them, let's look at one sentence. At that time, he somehow ever used to sort of be always seeking, I don't know how to say it, a rigorously valid reason, I guess, to attack him as soon as possible. So all the words or phrases written in bold here are adverbials. And this sentence illustrates the possibilities or the range of possibilities for adverbials and their placement in a sentence. Before we go and analyze these positions, it's important to, let's say, bust a very popular myth or a misconception. Most people, when they look at this, will say that this is a language of an educated, or sorry, of an uneducated person. But is it really? Think again, this, what you just heard, is the sentence uttered by this man. He's no longer that famous, although he won a Nobel Prize for Peace and an Oscar for the best documentary. This is Al Gore, US presidential candidate and a former US vice president. So a very educated person. So adverbial placement and let's say a huge number of adverbials in a sentence is not necessarily and by all means is actually not a sign of an uneducated manner of speech on the contrary uh, so al gore showed us that fundamentally you can put an adverbial in any gap that appears in your sentence. So instead of saying uh or uh or something like that, you can put an adverbial of the type uh, that is to say, you see, you understand, or even like, but do not overdo the like. Uh, so let's look at a different sentence, this time not by, uh, by Al Gore, and let's try to insert by then in this sentence. It's a relatively simple, short sentence. The book should have been returned to the library, full stop. Let's take by then and let's put it at the beginning. It's great. By then the book should have been returned to the library. We cannot put it between the and the book. You cannot say the by then book. But we can say the book by then should have been returned to the library. So we can put it in front of the subject or we can put it behind the subject in front of the first auxiliary. The first auxiliary, the operator is should. Then when it comes to the verb phrase and the verb phrase here is should have been returned, we can put by then in every single space between auxiliaries. So you can say the book should, should by then have been returned to the library. Perfect. You maybe have to put a little bit of stress there, but it's natural. The book should by then have been returned to the library. Similarly, you can say the book should have by then been returned to the library. Perfect. And Equally perfect is the book should have been by then returned to the library. So you see, theoretically, and not only theoretically, practically, you can put an adverbial in every single gap inside the verb phrase. What about the positions after the verb phrase? So the verb phrase is should have been returned and to the library is another adverbial optional the book should have been returned full stop perfect sentence to so the library is just an additional piece of information so optional adverbial well you can put by then 
behind returned. You can say the book should have been uh, returned by then to the library. And of course, you can put it after the adverbial. So at the end of the sentence, which reads something like the book should have been returned to the library by then. So in this simple sentence, there are exactly seven positions where you can insert an adverbial, an adjunct to be precise. And this means that we have some explaining to do. But intuitively, you can, let's say, assume that the first two positions are somehow initial, but this is only intuition. Actually, the only position which we call initial is in front of the subject. So the initial position is in front of the subject. Then, of course, the last one is called final. And those in between are medial. But the question is, where do you stop calling something medial? So is this returned by then to the library still medial or is it final? So I'm talking about this one. Is this final or medial? Well, according to virtually all linguists, it, that position is final. The medial ones are only those which are in front of the verb phrase, but behind the subject and within the verb phrase. There's one exception, I'll tell you about it, but for 99.99% .99 of instances, medial positions are those behind the subject and within the verb phrase. And the final positions are the positions behind the verb phrase or simply at the end of the sentence. And these are the terms which you should always use when you discuss adverbial positions. So this is not initial, middle and final. That's a very common mistake. This is medial. The difference between an expert and a layman is terminology. So use the right terminology. Not middle, medial. So how do we define these positions? Well, in the next slide, you will see that the initial position is actually very simple to define. It's simply the position before the subject. By then, the book should have been returned. Sometimes we go hiking. Last year, we organized a huge party. Uh, today, we're going to talk about the verbs. These are all initial positions. Why? Because these are adverbials in front of the subject. Notice that you can have multiple adverbials in the initial position. There should be no limit, really, except for the capacity of your brain, how many adverbials you can put in the initial position. You can say uh, sometimes, when we feel like it, and when we uh, have the right gear, um, sometimes reluctantly, we go hiking at weekends. So you can put three, four, five adverbials in front of the subject. They are all in the initial position. So don't think that if you have multiple adverbials in, the, in this position before the subject, that only the first one is initial. No, we say that they are all in the initial position and their order is dependent on their meaning. But we'll discuss that when we start talking about semantics and the meaning, and that is the meanings of uh, adverbials. Unlike initial, the initial position, the medial position is really, really complicated. Uh, why? Because it depends on the complexity of the verb phrase. If you have a very simple verb phrase with the head of the verb, like I love cookies, of course, you cannot have multiple positions as, for example, when you have a complex verb phrase such as should have been returned. So uh, the number of medial positions depends on the complexity of the verb phrase. 
and you can loosely say that the medial position is inside or around the verb phrase. This around is slightly misleading, but that's because of a single verb, and I will explain. Normally, for all verbs except the verb to be, the verb to be is the complicated one, for all verbs except for the verb to be, the medial position is between the subject and the verb phrase and inside the verb phrase. So, something like, this hardly is my business, or I simply do not understand, is an uncontroversial position between the subject and the first auxiliary, or a modal auxiliary, or simply a lexical verb, such as is, this hardly is my business, or this hardly represents a good contribution. Things get uglier after this M1 position. This is called M1, medial one position behind the subject, before the verb or the lexic or the auxiliary. M2 is differently, uh, let's say, defined depending on whether the verb is a lexical verb to be or any other lexical verb. So, if the lexical verb be is uh, concerned, then the example that you are looking for is this one. She is still your friend. In every other situation, still would be classified as final. But with the verb to be as the only verb in the sentence and the lexical verb, this still is treated as medial two position. For other verbs, medial two is between the first auxiliary and the rest of the verb phrase. So they have just been arrested. So in this verb phrase, have been arrested, you could have, you always have M1 between the subject and the verb, but you can also put the adverbial between the operator and the rest of the verb phrase. So that's M2 the second available position in a verb phrase. M3 is only available if you have the second and the third auxiliary. So the second and the third auxiliary uh, need to exist in order for this to be available. So for example, with the verb she is, uh, is in the sentence she is your friend, there is no M3 position, but for a verb phrase such as should have been returned, there is M3 position and it's the position between the second have and the third auxiliary, so between have and been. The last position, which is again only available if you have three auxiliaries, is between the third auxiliary and the main verb. The book should have been by then returned to the library. So although it looks complex, it's not. Uh, so M1 is after the subject, between the subject and the verb, in other words. M2 is after B as a lexical verb or after the first auxiliary. If you have one, that's the only additional option. If you have more than one, it's still M2. M3 and M4 are if you have three auxiliaries. So M3 is between the second and the third, and M4 is between the third auxiliary and the main lexical verb, the head of the verb phrase. Unlike initial position, uh, final position is more complicated, but not as complicated as the medial position. So with final position, uh, we simply say that it's a position after the lexical verb, the head of the verb phrase, and other obligatory elements. So if you have a transitive verb, like John kissed Mary, uh, yesterday, is optional, the first final position that's available because Mary is the obligatory element. It's an object. The verb kiss needs an object. So, depending on whether you have uh, just the obligatory element or you have other 
elements at the end of the sentence, other adverbials, we distinguish between F1 and F2. F1 is the position which is immediately after the lexical verb, if it's intransitive, or after the obligatory complement. For example, I paid immediately for the book. Pay is intransitive. You can say I paid, full stop. So immediately is F1 because it's an intransitive verb. There are no obligatory elements. And this is the position immediately after the verb. For the book, for example, here is actually F2, the next position. And that's after a non-obligatory element or at the end of the sentence, if there are more uh, of these non-obligatory elements. So I paid for the book immediately. So for the book in this sentence would be F1. I paid for the book would be F1 and immediately is F2. And this, believe it or not, wraps up our overview of positions of adverbials. So you should remember that there are initial, medial, and final positions. There's only one initial position, although you can have many adverbials in that position. Medial positions, there are at least two, but if the verb phrase is complex and has three auxiliaries, you can have up to four medial positions. And there are two final positions. Some of them uh, in some sentences, there's only one final position, but if you have more than one element at the end of the sentence, then you have F1 and F2. F1 is immediately after the lexical verb or after an obligatory compound. F2 is after non-obligatory elements. So if you have two adverbials, the first one is F1, the second is F2. So we can tick this off, we finished adverbial positions. Uh, the next section is really short, and we will talk about the optionality of adverbials. So what do I mean by this? Uh, we now know that adverbials have many forms, that they can appear in seven different positions theoretically in a sentence, but we didn't address, let's say, the elephant in the room. Uh, and that is the very common conception that adverbials are optional. Generally speaking, even the biggest, the greatest among uh, linguists like David Crystal make sweeping sentence that the adverbial is the optional constituent. It can be left out. All others are obligatory. The problem with one size fits all solutions is that there is no size that fits all. Uh, it simply doesn't work like that. They often and usually not you actually there are always some exceptions, especially in uh, linguistics. Uh, so. Uh, as you know from your first year course and some discussions that we've had so far in this course, you know that some adverbials are obligatory. So let's compare the following sentences. Anne is Scottish. Anne is a Scotswoman. Anne is from Scotland. Anne is in Scotland. So when you think about let's say, how you could ask questions about these sentences. For the first two, you could say, what is Anne or what is Anne like? Uh, for the third one, where does Anne come from? And notice that you no longer use the verb is for this question. You have to change the verb to make this work. And uh, the last one is, where is Anne? Uh, so the first one uh, and the second one are examples of subject complements. Anne is Scottish, Anne is a Scotswoman. But the third and the fourth one, although they look similar to the first and the second one, are actually not 
subject components. They are adverbials and they are obligatory adverbials. Uh, so this means that David Christo is wrong. Adverbials are so adverbials are usually optional, but some adverbials are obligatory. So uh, in N is from Scotland and N is in Scotland, you are no longer uh, asking what or who, which are subject, object, and complement question. You are asking adverbial questions, where? And in one case, you even have to use a different verb, which proves that these, adverb these are actually adverbials. Uh, and on top of that, uh, this, uh, the verb be can be replaced with other verbs. So these are really obligatory adverbials. Uh, let's talk about Facebook as well. What is Facebook? Facebook is where you talk to the wall. Sorry, I couldn't resist this. Uh, but uh, this is another example of an obligatory adverbial. You cannot say Facebook is unless you're Mr. Zuckerberg because he thinks that Facebook is. I think therefore I am. The world exists because Facebook is. So uh, if you're a normal person you cannot say a sentence Facebook is because it needs an obligatory complement like Facebook is a nice uh, social platform that spies on you or an adverbial. Facebook is where you talk to the wall. So let's look at some other examples. He put the book on the shelf. I apologize, this uh, OD bracket should have come before the, not after the, but uh, you get the idea. Uh, sh uh, she put the cheese back. He threw the paper in the bin. Uh, so, in some cases, uh, among these sentences, you could argue that the final adverb is optional. So, for example, he put the book, you cannot argue that. He put the book, really, you have to continue uh, and say on the shelf. The same applies to she put the cheese back. She put the cheese where you have to continue back he threw the paper well theoretically you could say okay i can put the full stop there he threw the paper but the meaning of the verb changes considerably if you don't have in the bin so it's not that the threw in he threw the paper and threw in he threw the paper in the bin are the same throughs these are two different uh, through verbs one means uh, discard, the other one means throw in such a way as to hit a particular spot. In Serbian that would be baciti and ubaciti. So you remember when we discussed optionality in the first semester, the limit of the optionality is the meaning of the verb. If you discard in the bin, if you delete in the bin, the verb throw doesn't mean the same as he threw the paper in the bin. So these verbs are of course complex transitive. They are SVO A verbs. Uh, we did that in the first semester. And these are another set of adverbials that are obligatory. We don't have time to discuss this, but obligatory adverbials are always adjuncts, those that, which are integrated into the clause structure. And if you are into linguistics, there's this wonderful book, Adjunct Adverbials in English, uh, published 10 years ago, but still very much uh, up to date and current, where you can really uh, find amazing uh, insights into the behavior, optionality, and obligatory properties of adverbials. And with this, conclusion that David Christo is wrong and that adverbials are sometimes obligatory, not necessarily always optional, we can 
move forward to the final topic for today, which is the meanings of adverbials. Uh, of course, today, due to spatial and temporal limits in the sense that no lecture should be more than an hour and 15 minutes long in real face-to-face uh, -face, uh, lectures, we actually have an hour and a half, but you know that it's never an hour and a half because we also discuss some things, organizational things. Uh, we don't start on time. So original, I'd say that the, and it's really hard to keep your focus for an hour and a half. So uh, we are striving for lectures that are like an hour and 15 minutes long not two hours or three hours long. So um, because of those limitations, let's uh, focus only on the introduction to the semantics of adverbials. So we are going to focus on meanings of adverbials. So when we talk about adverbials, most linguists say that they are a ragbag category. Uh, what does it mean? It means that they are usually negatively defined. They are elements, sentence elements, which are not verbs. And do they do not have a participant function in the clause. What does it mean, a participant function? So subject is, let's say, the agent of the verb. So if you, uh, let's say, are writing an email, you are the agent, you are the one who is performing the action. Object is participant in the verbal action in the sense that it's being created through the activities of the subject. But if you say, I wrote an email this morning, this morning is not obligatory element and is not a participant in this activity. So if you think about he wrote a letter as a sentence, yesterday is not necessary. It's not a participant. The verb write needs only two participants, the one who writes and the thing which is being written. Yesterday is an extra piece of information and that's why we call adverbials adverbials because they add to the meaning of the verb. Uh, sometimes, however, adverbials are positively de uh, defined. So, for example, David Crystal, whom we, whom we proved to be wrong in his sweeping statement of optionality, is actually right in saying that uh, adverbials are uh, sentence elements that provide answers to questions how, why, where, and when. But he's wrong in the sense that there are many other questions that adverbials actually answer. Uh, so, uh, in the sense, Crystal is right in as in in as far as claiming that adverbials prototypically answer how, why, where, and when. This is manner, place, and time, which we already mentioned is the obligatory order of adverbials. And the reason why that is so is actually rooted in historical debates on adverbials. So uh, the verb, the word adverbial comes from Latin adverbum, so add something, so put something to the verb. Uh, so that's why Sinclair, who's in my opinion a more scientifically rigorous linguist than um, David Crystal, he defined an adverbial as a word or group of words, so phrases or clauses, that you add to a clause when you want to say something more about the circumstance of an event or situation, when it occurs, how it occurs, how much it occurs, or where it occurs. Uh, so, despite all of this, uh, even Sinclair uh, presents adverbials as something that may be said to have secondary importance. Uh, but in order to fully understand how important and how frequent adverbials are in normal communication, let's look at the following example. David sat silently in the grass, watching the insects which lay at different angles from one another on numerous blades of grass, like ships out in the roadstead. 
a caterpillar started to wriggle towards him, peering this way and that with interrog inter interrogatory antenna. A large cricket jumped to the handrail of the old bench, swaying it slightly and cleaning its face like a cat. Only then did David realize that a large tarantula climbed onto his arm, looking for a nice place to bask in the afternoon sunshine. Everything that is written in bold and underlined here are adverbials. And if you're thinking about this story, it's actually a true story. This is David, and this is a tarantula. David, of course, is David Attenborough. Um, he's the most famous documentary maker and uh, BBC TV personality. He actually created modern documentaries. So he's still alive and he's a national treasure, world treasure. Uh, and a huge environmentalist. Uh, so this is taken from um, an article that outlines some events from David's travels and documentaries. So let's see what happens if we take out these optional elements that have secondary importance. Uh, this is the sentence, this is the story. David said, a, a caterpillar started to wriggle. A large cricket jumped. David realized that a large tarantula climbed onto his arm. You cannot even erase all of them because unlike everything that David Crystal and uh, John Sinclair say, they are not optional all the time. Some of them are obligatory. So if we go back to the previous slide, as we found out when we discussed prepositional phrases that function as adverbials and adverb phrases that function as adverbials, adverbials in general are the most important sentence elements from the point of view communication. They provide the most important piece of information, subject and the verb, and the obligatory elements. They give you the participants. But that's like saying, in the news, something happened in the world. You have to give details, what happened, uh, when it happened, how it happened, why it happened. So all these additional pieces of information are expressed through adverbials. So that's why adverbials are immensely important, especially if you're uh, looking for a career in copywriting or in marketing in general, but also just from the point of view of the use of English, uh, it's important to understand the meanings expressed through adverbials and their interplay, because as you will see later, the order of adverbials is dependent on their meaning. Sometimes within a single group of adverbials, there is an order on how you should sort them depending on whether there is a particular subtype of an adverbial. So, for example, uh, we, met at, uh, uh, we met in London at a restaurant is not as good as, as we met at a restaurant in London. So, we'll explain why that is. So, uh, in order to understand the complexity and the richness of adverbial meanings, let's look at some examples before we end this lecture. So, you know this lady, just got married to an elf. I'm kidding, she got married to Orlando Bloom, who played an elf. So, this is Katie in her video, the one who got away. So, if you look, for example, at the lyrics of that song, in another life I would make you stay so I don't have to say you were the one that got away, most of the lyrics, the most important pieces of information are contained in adverbials. In another life tells you when, so I don't have to say where uh, you were the one that got away, is purpose, why I would make you stay. If you delete that, you end up with I would make you stay, which has no 
power and passion contained in the original sentence. So adverbials are really central communicative elements in everyday communication. Uh, this, of course, is not Katy Perry. This is Taylor Swift and the clone of Clint Eastwood. This is Clint Eastwood's son. Uh, of course, this is the video from several years ago. Uh, say you remember me standing on the standing in a nice dress staring at the sunset babe red lips and rosy cheeks say you see me again even if it's just in your wildest dreams so you can also say ah oh, oh. but if you delete adverbials you end up say you remember me babe say you see me Everything else are adverbials conveying completely different meanings. So say you remember me standing in a nice dress tells you how, how he should remember you. Staring at the sunset again, how? Uh, red lips and rosy cheeks, how? Manner. Uh, again, time. Even if it's just in your wildest dream, this is concession. You allow for the possibility that it's not very likely that he will remember her, but maybe in her in his wildest dreams. And that's how songs are made with adverbials. Uh, another example would be again from the one who got away. I should have told you what you meant to me, because now I paid the price. Because now I paid the price makes all the difference in this sentence because it's the reason why she should have uh, told him what he meant to her uh, then he wouldn't have died i know i hope you know the video uh, so when you think about you know sentences uh Let's take a sentence about evolution. Populations of organisms gradually change in response to their environment. If you delete adverbials, you cannot actually formulate basic scientific theories. That's how important adverbials are because adverbials provide you with information on the manner and cause, the reason for change. Uh, there are many other adverbials that are not uh, from science books and uh, pop videos. You could be doing many wonderful things if you were not sitting at your computer, like exercising with Nintendo V, but don't go out, stay in your houses. So you could be doing many wonderful things. Doesn't give you the condition. Doesn't um, doesn't actually uh, without this adverbial, the sentence has no hypothetical meaning. Uh, you will get killed if you don't drive carefully. Uh, you will get killed. Now it's definitive. You will get killed with an adverbial. It's a real possibility, but it's not the the only outcome uh, they camped at the beach tells you where whereas they camped is more like what they were doing and we don't know whether it was at the beach or near you know like um, garbage processing facility that stinks like hell so location is also important and this uh, these two photos is something that i really love uh, in the first photo, in the second photo, you have the same person. Uh, uh, this is Gianni Agnelli. He was the owner and one of the founding, let's say, people of Fiat, the big uh, industrial complex. They do not only produce cars. So uh, the only difference between a boy and a man is the size and the price of his toys. Uh, so when he was a boy, he used to dream of owning a sailboat. If you delete when he was a boy, you get a completely different interpretation of the sentence. So uh, time when, adverbials of time are important. The scientists examined the sample with a microscope. Uh, the scientists examined the sample maybe with their 
I don't know, uh, by licking them, heaven forbid, but with the Microsoft is an in, with the microscope is an instrument. So it's one of the crucial pieces of information when it comes to interpreting the meaning of the sentence. They walked hand in hand, they walked, you lose the romantic overtones of this sentence. So uh, they walked is terrible. Hand in hand is now romantic. So manner is also important. So to illustrate uh, the importance of adverbials, we can compare the sentence such as he ran, which is a sentence without adverbials. And naturally, when he saw an Albertosaurus, he ran as fast as he could, which is a sentence with adverbials. So the bottom line is a sentence with, without adverbials is just the skeleton, the bare bones of a sentence, uh, something that is devoid of any details, any vivid descriptions. A sentence with adverbials is a real thing. The Jurassic Park, a real dinosaur with all its features. Uh, so there are many other meanings and we will all go through them uh, next week. So if possible, ring me later is something called contingency. Although he's young, he's good. That's called concession. While he slept, I work. this is called contrast. I would go, except I can't. That's an exception. Knowing her, I chose a red one. That's the reason. I fed the stray to gain its trust. Stray dog. Uh, this is the result uh, or purpose. The dog obeyed as instructed comparison. I would fight rather than quit preference. Ankara, I believe, is the capital. This is a disjunct. And in other words, we have a lot of work to do. And this uh, part of the lecture is here to introduce you to the beautiful, intricate, sometimes complex, always fuzzy, but still beautiful world of semantic classification of adverbial. So with this, we finished our daily to-dos. And despite my promise to keep this in within the 1.15 minute boundary, it's I think one hour, uh, sorry, one hour and 15 minute limit. It's actually, I think one hour and 24 minutes. Uh, so it's like a proper lecture. Uh, before we split and self-isolate and not go out, Remember, don't go out. Let me introduce you to a homework. So your homework is now focused on adverbials. So last week we finished prepositional phrases and at home, when you did your homework, you finished the, home, uh, the prepositional phrase exercises. So we're moving to the adverbials. So I will ask you to do the first exercise on adverbials, which is about types of uh, structures used to form adverbials. So this is about adverbial forms. Then exercise number two, which is about types of adverbials, adjunct, disjunct, conjunct. Then return to exercise number one and analyze adverbial types there. Is it an adjunct, disjunct, or a conjunct? And then move to exercise number five, and exercise number six, which are, let's say, warm-up exercises for the exercises on meaning and positions of adverbials. With that, uh, I would simply wrap up this class with asking you all to stay safe, not go out unless absolutely necessary for groceries, do some learning, do some binge watching, do some social networking over the phone. And let's hope that we will see each other in normal circumstances in late April or May. Thanks and we'll be YouTubing again in a week's time. Bye.